you know, between the fluidity and my sense of self and my ADD, I suspect that my demon would never actually settle on a form. His Dark Materials, or at least the first four episodes of it. Um, this wasn't something that I had intended to watch. I actually got commissioned uh, to watch it through Patreon, which is something you can do. Actually, it was a funny thing, because one a Patreon supporter commissioned me to watch the first two episodes, and then another commissioned me to watch another two, which is why I watched four. Now, I went into this thinking that okay, I'll watch the first four episodes, and if I'm really into it, maybe I'll watch the rest and give my thoughts on the whole thing. I didn't do that. I stopped at the four, which should probably give uh, <laughs> at least an overview impression of my thoughts on it. So here's the first thing that you need to know, because I actually think it matters more here than it would normally when it comes to my opinion and views on a piece of work. I don't know the original. I never read the books. I haven't even seen the previous adaptation, the film version of The Golden Compass, because I, well, I've seen bits and pieces of it, but it didn't look that great, and I just never got around to the books. I heard very mixed things about them, especially by the time that it wrapped up, and I was just like, eh, I'll pass. So I am coming at this as a person with no foreknowledge of the world, the characters, how it works, the system of society, the stakes, really anything. I'm coming in cold, and I think that is the key reason why I didn't enjoy it. I don't think this adaptation was made with people who have zero familiarity with the source material in mind. It did very little to meet me halfway. It did not feel like it was extending very many olive branches to try and get me on board. Now, maybe the books are like that too, I don't know. I would think probably not, if for no other reason, or at least not to this degree, if for no other reason than the fact that in the written form, you have the potential for narrative exposition. You don't have to find a way to drop everything into dialogue because through the narration and just the way things are described, a lot of information can just be dropped in the text straightforwardly. Um, and obviously, in a visual medium, you lose the ability to do that. And so all I'm left with is the contextual stuff. And <sighs> for me to get my head wrapped around this, I needed a lot more straight up exposition than I got. I'm not going to say I understood nothing, but the number of fundamental questions that I had about how this world even works and who, like, the general standing of any of the things going on beyond really broad strokes that I didn't find engaging, I needed more information than this. And I'm sure the information exists, and I'm gonna say up front before I even start getting into specific criticisms, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions and saying a lot of things that I feel were poorly explained or didn't make sense. And I know a ton of people in the comments are gonna be leaving me details from, well, it was this, well, it was this, this is what it means, like, I... I'm not asking because I actually want you to answer them. I'm asking because four episodes in, I feel I shouldn't still be asking this many fundamental questions as I'm going to be putting out there. I'm not saying there's no answers. I'm saying that four episodes in, I don't have them and I kind of don't care is a problem. That's the point I'm making. So please don't respond with comments answering the things that I don't understand because I'm already done. <laughs> with this series. I feel that it has failed to make the effort to bring me as someone with no foreknowledge into it, and answering the questions isn't suddenly going to make me think this thing was any better than I currently think it is. Okay? Okay. So, I'll try and start positive because it's not like it's a bad show. It certainly is well shot. The, um, the performances are, honestly, they are a little mixed. There are a handful of, and I would say in key roles, very committed performances. I would say Mrs. Coulter, Lyra, Asriel, 
I've not forgotten the name of Lin-Manuel Miranda's character, but him as well. They really felt like they got their characters and were committed to delivering what needed to be brought across about themselves. Most, though not all, but most of the other characters, they... I didn't get a real sense of performance about them. Like, and if I got anything, it was real one note. There doesn't seem to be a lot of depth in most of the supporting characters, and it doesn't help that a lot of the dialogue is really stilted. The actors who I named do a pretty good job of bringing some life uh, into the uh, characters that they're portraying, but everybody else, it, their lines, no, not everybody, but nearly everybody else, their lines read really flat, which is weird to me because normally line readings that flat, I would have thought was because, well, it's an exposition line, so it's difficult to deliver. Except they, most of them aren't exposition lines because there's not enough exposition for me to even wrap my head fully around this world and this setting. So th that's not really the case, but the line readings are still flat. I have to wonder, and I have no way of confirming this, the way that it sounded a lot of the time was like they lifted lines directly from the book, which nine times out of ten is a really bad idea except for any like specific iconic lines of dialogue. The reason for that is, and I'm not sure if, if people properly realize this, but there are things and ways of speaking that you can get away with on the page because you don't have to hear a human being try to speak them. It's part of why expositional dialogue doesn't sound as clunky written as it does on screen. That's not to say that it can't still be done poorly on the page. It can, but there isn't as much of a necessity to have realistic, natural, flowing dialogue on the page. If a writer can do it, that's great, but they don't have to and they can get away with it without doing that. But once people have to actually say these words, and you have to hear them said by people that's supposed to sound like a conversation, and they're, they're written in a way that was designed to work on the page, suddenly a lot of it doesn't work. And again, I have no idea if lines were lifted directly from the books, but the stilted way in which a lot of the lines are delivered and written certainly made it feel to me like that was probably the case. But that's a guess on my part. That's me trying to figure out why I didn't get into this thing all that much. So, my standard grace period for any show is usually three episodes. If I'm three episodes in and it hasn't hooked me, if it hasn't given me a reason to want to keep coming back, I usually walk. So this thing had one more episode than my usual grace period, and it still didn't really get me. I'll grant that episode four was better than the preceding three episodes, but that was really just because of the, pres the presence of Lin-Manuel Miranda, because he livened things up a whole bunch. But I'm not sure that's enough to keep me going. Like I said, I have a hard time wrapping my head around this world, and a lot of the idiosyncrasies, and I don't know how much of this, again, is direct from the book or not, but the mix of the world as I know it and a world very much not the one I know, for me, was poorly balanced. Because, in my mind, if you're going to so directly evoke the world I know to the point that you actually use city names of real cities of, like, London and Essex, and you have, you know, boats that are recognizable as the style of boats that, like, I would know from the time, you know, maybe a little bit run down, a little up, but, but like, it's, it's a riverboat. That looks familiar. I've seen stuff like that. And you know, apartments with elevators, and like, it all seems very familiar, like, of the world I, I have, then there's only so much world-breaking mythology you can add into that before it doesn't track anymore. And what I mean by that is this, it probably would have flowed for me if it was just a case of the demons are part of this, and... Maybe with the kidnapped children, maybe the thing with the, maybe, you know, the dust as a lore, but the instant you introduce something like the Magisterium, which is so powerful that it very clearly shapes and controls the world, 
at that point, that is such a massive departure structurally from how the world I know works that I now have a hard time believing that this world has so much in parallel with the one I know. That there would still be a London. That they would still have a similar technology track. Um, you know, at least up to a certain point. And, like, the, that is such... that. Something that big, that big a change, I'm like, well, this can't be the world I know anymore. And so now all the elements that look like they're lifted directly from the world I know aren't gelling and they feel dis incongruous to me. And part of that may actually just be an issue with the show as opposed to the book, because if the book simply called, say, the boats that the Egyptians have, which I thought... I don't know what it is about that name that really, like, eh. Actually, you know what? That was one of the things about the dialogue that really threw me off. They keep, they don't have nicknames or shortened for anything. Like, so, when talking about or even to people, people keep using their first and last name. Like, like with the Costas. They'd say Tony Costa, Billy Costa. They never just say Tony. Like, I think the mother is the only one who says just Tony or just Billy. Everyone else says the full name. Every time they address anyone, it's First and last name every time. I think it's part of why the dialogue felt so unnatural. Anyway, mm, moving on from that. So, like, things like the boats that the Egyptians have, those might be described in the book as simply being boats, which leaves it more or less to the reader to decide what they look like. But when I see them, it's clear that for the probably for the purposes of budget control, the BBC just grabbed boats that they have, i.e. real boats that really exist in this world. And it's the same with a lot of the exterior shots and the buildings. I'm like, that's something that I know and recognize. So it's not otherworldly, but the degree of otherworldliness, and again, it's not just the demons, it's like the fundamental world and history of this place with things like the Magisterium being so different from how the world I know works, I, I, it, it doesn't gel. It might gel in something a little bit more irreverent, something not taking itself so seriously, something with a lighter, more whimsical feel. Maybe I could probably roll with it, but this thing is deathly serious, and that doesn't help either in terms of my trying to roll with this. And the demons, while I said, you know, they're fine, they're actually kind of not, at least as far as I've gotten into this, because... I don't get it. Like, I get the concept, like, somebody's soul is an external thing with the opposing gender that they have that shifts until they hit puberty, then it solidifies into a form, but, you know, there's the logistical questions of, has this been the case for all people forever in the history of time? Why do I keep seeing characters, usually non-important ones, but why do I keep seeing characters moving around who appear to have no demons with them whatsoever? I know the real reason. They didn't want to spend the money to CGI up a whole bunch of demons for characters who didn't matter. But that question comes up for me. And, like, does the appearance of someone's demon, is that actually a reflection of something about about them, because it feels like sometimes it's implying that it is, other times if it's doing that, I don't quite get what the link is. Why do some people's demons talk freely? Why do others, like, never speak? And maybe there's answers that come down the line for this, but it's a fundamental factor of this world, and I'm just sitting here going, ah, but more importantly than the logistical questions, narratively, four episodes in, I don't understand why Philip Pullman created them. So far, as far as their impact on the plot or the narrative, they don't serve a lot of function. They're a gimmick. Again, as far as I've gotten, you could remove them and really all you would lose is a little bit of dialogue that some characters, like Lyra, have with their demons, but that's about it. You don't lose much narrative and plot. So for the purposes of the story being told, I don't know why they exist. So I'm left with questions both narrative, you know, both narrative storytelling and logistical, which just having both those questions makes it frustrating. And again, this really just feels like it's here for people who already know.
so you can watch and see this world that you've read brought to life. But as someone who doesn't know this stuff, I'm just put off. You know, and we've got this whole thing with other worlds and dust and nobody even really explains why we have questions about dust. I get that dust is kind of a mysterious thing, but I don't understand why anyone is looking into it, why other people are afraid of it being looked into. It seems to just be, well, because the Magisterium is scary. Well, that you, could you give me a little bit more than that? Because again, I don't understand the structure and how this organization works and how it has the level of control that it does. I just... The one thing that it tried to give me to latch on to that I... I Maybe if it flowed a little better and other things fell into place, I could have latched on to, in spite of not having an overall view and feeling like I got this world, is the idea kids kidnapped rescue kids. I That might have been enough, except they didn't... They didn't get me rightfully invested... Well, no, I take that back. They did start to get me invested in Roger, but it seems like so much of the emphasis on rescuing is on Billy Costa, who's a character who I don't know aside from he's kidnapped. So, like, the one visceral thing, the one tangible goal that I get, I don't have enough investment in for that to override all the hidden goals and agendas that people have that I don't know about and I have no investment in because I don't know what the stakes are. So, and also... <clears throat> I, I, I was off to a rough start right at the beginning because the opening text crawl mentions a prophecy. The, the degree to which I'm done with prophecy and Chosen One narratives, and that's not saying there are no good ones. I'm just saying I'm sick of them. Much like Doctor Who Mystery Box series arc, you know, as a, as a way to connect to the overall stories of that show. I'm done with them. Doesn't mean they're always bad. It just means I'm sick of them. Same thing with prophecies and chosen ones. And initially, it seemed like it was going to dodge a bullet because clearly Lyro is this thing's form of a chosen one. Fine. But initially, it was grounding what she was doing in much more tangible things that made immediate sense. Her friend's missing. She wants to find her friend. But then as soon as she hooks up with the Egyptians, then all the chosen one nonsense comes in. Like, oh, she can just magically use the... I can't remember what the heck it's called, so I'm just going to call it the Golden Compass. Forgive me, but like, she can just use it. Why? Because of authorial decree. She's important because the author has declared her so <sighs> by means of a prophecy. I'm just, I'm just not invested. And again, I'm not sure that I'd actually call it bad. Only that from the perspective by which I came at this thing, as somebody with barely any knowledge about it at all, no. I can't get into it. And I suspect it's probably good if you know something more about the source material or if you're willing to extend it a slightly longer leash than I am. Like I said, it's not completely devoid of hooks. It's just the ones that it has offered by, by the end of episode four aren't enough for me to sink more time into it. I've got other stuff to do and I don't really feel like moving forward with this feeling a lot of people are going to be annoyed with me. A lot of people are going to tell me how they didn't read the original, but they still got into the show, or that I'm an idiot, or, you know, I... This feels like the kind of thing where people are going to think I'm attacking a fandom, and I'm not. I don't understand this thing well enough to attack it on its fundamentals beyond the use of prophecy. I'll attack it for that, because I'll attack anything for that at this point. But, you know... I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't get it. And maybe that is on me, but that's where I land. His Dark Materials, this series. Have you seen it? What do you think about it? You probably liked it, but like looking at getting a general read on just like viewer reviews and the IMDb score and things like that, people seem to like it, so... Whatever your thoughts are on it, or whatever reason you think I'm a moron for not sticking with it, go ahead and drop it down in the comments, and we'll talk about it as long as you can be polite. Don't call me a moron. 
that'd be nice. But, you know, whatever. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Plus, you know, there's other stuff that you can do besides just comment, because like, subscribe, support on Patreon. That's how I got commissioned to view these things in the first place. I hope that they don't want their money back, given my feelings on the thing. <sighs> I feel really bad when I get commissioned for something, and I suspect they wanted me to enjoy it, and I don't. But that's it. That's, you know, that's just the way it is. But you can support me on Patreon as well, all the other stuff, but uh, you don't have to do it either, because end of the day, folks, you're the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.